Hi, I'm Dr. Mo, and today's lesson is about parthenogenesis. What is parthenogenesis? It means virgin birth, but don't worry, it's not a religious thing. In science, it is a form of asexual reproduction where eggs will develop into embryos without being fertilized. In most cases, parthenogenesis means females of a population giving birth, usually to more females, without the need for any males. Parthenogenesis is a naturally occurring process in a whole bunch of species, and it is usually divided into different types. Obligate parthenogenesis is when a species will only reproduce through parthenogenesis. We gave an example of this during the radiophiles lecture of bedelloid rotifers. This group of rotifers are exclusively female, and they give birth to offspring through parthenogenesis, laying eggs without being fertilized through sex. As I mentioned in that lecture, deloid rotifers have gone tens of millions of years reproducing exclusively asexually. There are no males known from this class of rotifers. Many species of salamanders and frogs are also unisexual species that use parthenogenesis as their only means of reproduction. Salamanders have the oldest known unisexual vertebrate species some of which have gone four to five million years without sexual reproduction. Obligate parthenogenesis is probably far more common than you realize. There are many species over a wide range of organisms that are unisexual, including spiders, brine shrimp, lizards, snakes, and fish. For species that normally reproduce sexually, but that occasionally will spontaneously produce through parthenogenesis, this type of parthenogenesis is referred to as facultative parthenogenesis. One of the main conditions that are thought to induce parthenogenesis in organisms that usually reproduce sexually is a lack of a viable male in the environment. Spontaneous parthenogenesis is rare, but has been observed in a very wide range of organisms. It has been confirmed to occur in species of sharks, snakes, Komodo dragon, snails, and even birds. One of the most interesting types of facultative parthenogenesis that occurs in organisms is usually referred to as cyclic parthenogenesis. In this case, rather than being some spontaneous and rare occurrence, it is simply part of the life cycle of an organism. In this case, parthenogenesis is usually driven by some seasonal pattern or environmental cue. Some species of water bears are like this. They can reproduce normally sexually, but under certain circumstances they will reproduce asexually. There are a few classic examples of cyclic parthenogenesis that we will cover in today's lecture. The first of these is the other major class of rotifers, the monogonontoid rotifers. In this group, the dominant form of reproduction is asexual. In most cases, the females that reproduce asexually are called amictic females, and they lay eggs that will hatch and produce more amictic females. In a single season, this may happen 20 to 40 times, with most of the population being produced asexually and incapable of producing eggs that will generate male offspring. Most of the time, amictic rotifer eggs only take about a day to develop into an adult amictic female rotifer. A couple of times during the year, however, some environmental cue will happen and an egg will produce a mictic female rotifer that will lay a mictic egg. The mictic egg operates kind of like a decision tree. If the egg is not fertilized, in other words, there are not enough males around in the population to fertilize it, then the egg will form a male rotifer. If there is already enough males around, it leads the egg to be fertilized and will then produce a thick-walled resting egg. The resting egg is highly resistant to any harsh conditions that may occur normally, such as desiccation or elevated salinity. That might normally kill an amectic egg. When the conditions in the water are good, however, the resting egg will hatch, where it always produces an amictic female, and it restarts the asexual reproduction cycle again. Although they belong to Crustacea, 
Cladocera, like Daphnia, are also known to have cyclic parthenogenic reproductive styles. They follow a similar pattern to the one that occurs in rotifers. Most of the population is parthenogenic females that produce eggs which hatch into parthenogenic daughters. In the case of Daphnia, they have a hard exoskeleton and, in order to grow, they have to molt. They keep their eggs bound to their exoskeleton and every time they molt to grow, they will release a clutch of new eggs. In the life cycle of Daphnia, they may molt as many as 20 times, each time releasing a clutch of parthenogenic eggs. Eventually, unfavorable environments will occur for the Daphnia. Seasonally, this could be something like desiccation or cooling water temperatures or perhaps overcrowding and low food quality or even a change in the day length. These environmental cues will cause some of the eggs to develop into males and some of the eggs to develop into sexual females. When the sexual reproduction happens, instead of a new clutch of eggs, the sexual female Daphnia will produce something called an amphibium. Just like the resting eggs of the rotifer, when the Daphnia molts or dies, the amphibia will act like a seed bank, and when the conditions are favorable again, parthenogenic females will hatch from the resting age from the resting eggs and start the cycle over again. Our final example of cyclic parthenogenesis comes from aphids. Like the Daphnia and the rotifers we already discussed, aphids' cyclic reproduction strategy is seasonal in nature. In early spring, an aphid will hatch from eggs that survive through the winter. Eggs always produce a female aphid, which begins giving birth to wingless female aphids. Wingless aphids are capable of giving birth live. The nymphs actually develop from the eggs within the asexual mothers. Eggs of an aphid will actually begin to develop immediately after ovulation, and since there is no need for male aphids to fertilize the offspring, it is possible for aphids to give birth to offspring that are already developing eggs inside of them. In other words, the offspring are actually born pregnant. This strategy allows for aphids to reproduce asexually very, very quickly. In fact, under ideal circumstances, it is possible for an aphid to produce 600 billion descendants in a single season. Winged female aphids will also form occasionally, which will allow the aphids to emigrate to new plants. This is important because some aphids have to select different host plants seasonally. In the fall, the winged females that are born will migrate to a new host type of plant, and their offspring will be a mix of sexual females and males. When these mate, they will produce eggs, which typically will last through the winter and start the cycle over again. It should be obvious from these examples why an organism would benefit from parthenogenesis. It allows the population to grow very rapidly and quickly colonize an environment. In some studies of invasive species of snails, scientists have also discovered that the rate of parthenogenesis is much higher than usual, suggesting that it may be a strategy to deal with an initially low population density as well. But what are the negatives with parthenogenesis? Well, probably the most troubling problem for an organism is that fully asexual reproduction means that you aren't able to recombine genetic material anymore. So while it might produce some sort of short-term gains, for most species becoming asexual endangers the whole species, since they can no longer add to the genetic variety of the species and they are vulnerable to extinction as a result. I hope you have enjoyed this short educational lecture on how parthenogenesis works. Please consider subscribing to catch more from the teachers at Spirit University.